Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Well, today we remember and give thanks, among other things, that Martin Luther stood up for the gospel and championed grace. Um, Luther saw Jesus and God's word was being obscured and twisted, so uh, despite real mortal peril, Luther said, I cannot and I will not recant, so help me God. He said this to a room full of people who, who fully expected and were pressuring him to back down. Well, still today, we want to proclaim the gospel boldly. Instead of letting things like media or our, our own desires or our emotions or really anything else at all, we want our foundation to be in Christ. And we want to be loyal to that amazing um, and merciful message of, of grace and renewal through Christ. Um, we don't just uh, here, we, we're not just reading stories, rather we encounter Jesus. We, we really meet our God, we believe, through word and sacrament. You say the point of church is not to play a game or entertain ourselves. We're here interacting with our, our Lord and God and striving to live in his kingdom and as his people. Um, thankfully, it's not about our perfection it's about God's perfection, we might say, or we might say another way, it's about God's amazing, astounding, saving grace. However, in our gospel lesson for today, a great preacher and hero of the faith, we might say, John the Baptist, is questioning that. He's wondering whether faith in God really is enough. John the Baptist is in prison in chapter, Matthew chapter 11, and his life and ministry have taken a definite turn for the worse, and he is starting to doubt. So he sends some of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you really the one who I, prophesied, who I was prophesying about, or should we be waiting for someone else? Well, John was wondering if Jesus really was the one who had come to rescue the world. After all, that's what John was preaching, uh, that God was going to rescue his people. But you know what? I hadn't really noticed this much before, but I think it might be even more than that. You know, John might actually be applying a little pressure on Jesus to act. His question, if you look at it, it seems to assume Jesus should be doing more than he is doing. It, I don't know if it's quite a threat, a veiled threat, but it might be more like a warning. John saying, like, if you're the one who was to come, well, why don't you break me out of prison? Or, Jesus, you need to get a move on before you lose people, like my disciples. And John insinuates that if Jesus won't do some saving, Jesus might not be the one. Earlier, John had certainly preached that Jesus was the one. Jesus' preaching, after all, was very consistent with the message John was giving. John and Jesus both emphasized the hearts and minds of God's people were what was most important. Both preached humility and condemned arrogance. They advocated for a return to the Lord in heart, not just in outward show. John had told the people to repent, in fact, to get ready for the coming Messiah. This Messiah would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He would clean up and rescue God's people. When Jesus came to John to be baptized, John exclaimed, What are you doing? I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Why, why is Jesus baptized by John? Well, there's a couple reasons, but one is because Jesus had come to finish what John started to carry on God's mission of saving based on repentance and God's arrival, just as John preached. Jesus is not just, but Jesus took it a step further. He not only encouraged people to trust and repent through the cross, he actually forged a way for God's people to do that. He gave them an opportunity to repent and trust through his life and death. But 
John is currently, back to the text, having a crisis of faith. The voice that cried out so clearly and boldly in the wilderness is now a voice full of doubts, questions, and even perhaps demands. Maybe you're or have been in a similar spot before. You're wondering where God is, what he's doing. You know, or at least you've heard about, how Jesus comes to save. The Gospels tell us about all kinds of people that he helps out, right? But in the midst of your pain or your loss or struggles, you can't help but wonder, why is he not rescuing you? Perhaps you are even at the point where you half want to demand God fixes something or you're considering jumping ship. Well, we'll see folks like these later tonight, some of you undoubtedly, because it's, it's a day for heroes. And that's the kind of God that we're looking for, a hero to save us. And the name Yeshua or Jesus literally means God saves. He is a hero. Saving is who Jesus is. It's, it's what he does. But when you're in prison, it hardly feels like you're being saved. When you're in the hospital or enduring chronic pain or healthcare problems that just get worse or you butt up against problems that just won't go away, it sure doesn't seem like God's doing much rescuing, does it? Jesus' answer to John is, look at my witness. Look at what I've done. I am and I have rescued people. And if you look around, you can see it starting. But what Jesus d does not offer John is kind of what John wants. He does not offer John a solution. But instead, he invites him to trust. You see, uh, the fundamental problem with this world is not that we have done bad things or that the world has gone bad. The most basic problem uh, our, with our relationship with God, which is the start of all the other problems, at a, a cellular, you might say, or molecular level, at the most basic level, if I can put it as that way, is a lack of trust. That's really what causes all the rest of the problems. God desires to work in and among us, but when we, but uh, He totally and completely does want to fix things. But a real fix cannot really take place until we really trust Him. The, the problem with our world is not simply fixing this or that problem, nor is it making us feel better. That's what Jesus doesn't really do for John. He doesn't really make him feel better. But the real problem is that we will not trust in our Creator or Redeemer. We often think a solution, the solution that we need, is God make me feel better. Yet when we reject God's correction, we're rejecting a necessary step towards fixing evil, pain, and death in the world and in ourselves. In our doubts, demands, and questions, Jesus often does not make us feel better. But what he does is he in instead teaches us to trust. And he works on transforming us, which sometimes is unpleasant. But faith and trust, by the very nature of the, those things themselves, tr faith and trust requires that we rely on God, not upon ourselves or quick fixes. We often don't get those things, quick fixes or answers. Rather, we're told to take up our cross and follow Jesus. That we follow Jesus, but he doesn't tell us to go by ourselves, but we, we pick up our cross and follow him, who took up his cross and laid down his life for us. The cross shows us a couple of things. It shows us first that humankind solutions often lead to death. The cross demonstrates that the world's attitude towards God is it wants him out of the picture. And our own cross that Jesus calls us to pick up is whatever it is that makes it hard for us to follow Jesus. Things that we could avoid if we just gave up faith. Nevertheless, the cross is also an invitation to faith. When we proclaim Christ crucified and resurrected, 
It's really an invitation to believe that Jesus will rescue us and that the way that he will rescue us is through his death and resurrection. No matter how many times you've heard it, the key is not simply understanding the story of Christ crucified and resurrected. The key is trusting that that is the way that God will save us. Um, Today, again, we have a wonderful opportunity to trust in our Lord. Um, This autumn, if your life is falling apart, you have a precious and wonderful opportunity not to give up, but to have faith, to hold on to your Savior. Believe in Jesus and hold on to his promise that he will sustain and restore you in his time. Now, um, when one of the benefits of being a pastor, I've talked with many folks uh, over periods of years, and sometimes I, I see individuals as they're, um, you know, as they're growing older and their quality of life deteriorates over time. Um, and I've seen, not, not necessarily in church, but I've seen in other people, many people whose faith isn't robust or isn't there, they, they simply lose hope. Um, and others who have strong faith, they still often wonder and, and are worried Why won't God ease my suffering? And I don't know the answer. And I can't promise that you'll feel better. But there is an opportunity and and a powerful witness that that you can give. Uh, Whenever we struggle or suffer or mourn, and yet we hold on to our faith, it's a witness. When we strive to be good, patient, kind, and self-controlled, even when we are really hurting or attacked, well, that, that can speak volumes to our loved ones or to anyone who is paying attention. People who would not listen before might pay attention, and the word of Christ might sink into their hearts and change their lives. You know, as we look at this story, we know the rest of the story. John will not be broken out of prison. Um, John the Baptist is killed. He's killed because of unfair reasons, because of lust, bitterness, pride, and cowardice. The world will kill John without cause, without apology, and without common decency. Just like Jesus was killed for those same reasons. Lust, bitterness, pride, cowardice, without without apology or respect or common decency. And yet, Christ died to save the world from these things. In fact, Christ died to save you from these things. Your lust, pride, cowardice, and bitterness, these were your sins, but Christ has forgiven you of them. And he gives us faith. He allows us to believe it's not only up to us, but we hold on and we receive God's Holy Spirit that enables us to believe in Christ's promises. Jesus has indeed come to save. And we can see examples of his saving and his rescuing all around us, not only in the stories of the scripture, but also in the lives often of others around us, of fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. He doesn't rescue us on our own timeline, but he does invite us still today to trust to trust in his promise that he will rescue us, and we can wait faithfully for him to faithfully redeem and rescue us. So we continue to rejoice, to repent, and to rely on God's salvation through Christ our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.